Hello, welcome to this roundtable uh, where we're going to be talking about the latest edge skills shortage bulletin. Uh, now, this is a series that we've designed and been developing at edge over the last three years, um, highlighting the really important area uh, of the changing shape of the labour market uh, and drawing on some of the amazing research and examples that are out there uh, in the system and from some of our partners. Now, um, obviously, we're recording this at the start of 2021, uh, following a year of upheaval in the economy and in society, uh, and we're publishing the eighth bulletin in this series. Uh, you can find the bulletin itself online at our EDGE website, that's www.edge.co.uk, uh, and we'll put the link in the show notes from this. Now, to bring it to life, I've invited some of uh, my amazing contributors and partners to join me today for a discussion about some of the key messages uh, and about what that means for education and for young people. So I'm going to start by introducing each of them in turn and asking them to just share some of the key messages from their articles in the bulletin. Uh, then we'll bring it together for a bit of a discussion about some of the cross-cutting themes and some advice for young people at the end. So first of all, I'm really pleased to introduce one of our close colleagues. Uh, Fiona Aldridge is the Director for Policy and Research at the Learning and Work Institute. Fiona. Thanks, Lonnie. Um, it's great to be able to talk about um, the piece that we've written for um, uh, the Skills Shortages publication. And the essence of um, my piece is that we are still trying to understand both the scale and the nature of the economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic. It, it's still developing, but um, it has been um, very profound. Um, and what we um, have suggested in the article is that um, the impacts have very much been, rather than introducing new effects, have been exacerbating existing um, inequalities. So, for example, we know that unemployment has risen most in those areas that were already uh, left behind and had weaker economies um, to start off with. We know that people with lower level qualifications um, or no qualifications um, have been most affected, as have those um, in lower skilled occupations. There are particular concerns about young people and about older workers, and for older workers in particular, in the first few months of the crisis, we saw the number of older workers who were claiming unemployment related benefits um, double. And of course, we know that if you leave the labour market when you're older, it's much harder uh, to come back to an equivalent level job. And of course, for young people, not only is that disruption to their education, but they, they enter a labour market um, which is significantly depressed. So, so very much enhancing those inequalities that we've seen beforehand, rather than introducing new things. So my piece focuses on three things that I really think we need to do. One is very much to have um, effective employment support for those who are out of work and as well as thinking about people who have newly lost their jobs we need to remember that there were some people who were already out of work and we need to think about what the offer is for them um, as they uh, fall into long-term unemployment. Um, the second is to think about how we create jobs of course we need to give people support into work but those jobs have to be there in the first place and so we have a set of proposals about how we link public investment with job creation. And thirdly, it's about how to improve people's skills in order to position them well to get those new jobs. Um, what we know before the crisis is that if you were looking for a new job, you looked for something that was quite similar uh, to the job that you had left. So maybe in the same sector with a similar employer. But the sectoral nature of this crisis means that many of those jobs aren't there. And more than ever, people will need to think about the transferability of their skills into very different parts of the economy. And we've set out a set of proposals about how you support people to transfer their skills, to think about different types of work and to think about how you help people retrain. It's all based on research and policy papers that we've developed throughout the year. And you can find out more in the article and through our website. And I'm very much uh, looking forward to contributing uh, to this discussion and hearing the thoughts of others. That's wonderful, Fiona. Thank you so much. And thank you for kicking us off on that really important theme of transferability that's come across uh, in a lot of the skills shortage bulletins and a lot of the work, not just here in the UK, but the work we've featured, for instance, from the World Economic Forum internationally as well. Now, one of the most important surveys in this area and long-standing surveys is the Employer Skills Survey uh, run by government. And to, to give us a few key messages from the latest one, uh, I'd love to welcome you, Leslie uh, Giles, who is Director at Work Advance. Leslie, over to you. Thanks very much, Ole. And um, can I just say that I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to um, contribute to this skills bulletin and take part in this round table in terms of 
discussing key sources of labour market information and turning that into intelligence because I think that's sort of one really one of my key messages is that when we're thinking about all these information sources we do need to really think how we can act on them to um, sharpen the skill system and whilst I don't uh, manage the uh, employer skill survey now um, I was delighted to sort of have a role in in managing it previously um, and I'm really glad that although we're going through austerity and we have so much you know pressure on public finances that government is still backing the survey because it is a real gem in our sort of toolbox of labour market information. I think there's a real risk in this digital economy and data rich world and talking about day, big data that we um, you know, undervalue and devalue some of these traditional labour market sources. And the UK Employee Skills Survey is really, really key. It's so comprehensive. It sort of really gives us really strong insights into uh, employers' uh, employment and skills requirements and how they're changing over time, how they're conditioned um, by changes in, in the marketplace and market conditions. And also importantly, they, they give us information about how employers are engaging with the skill system. So although we may be pushing forward really what we think are brilliant education reform programs, if employers are not engaging with them, then there's something wrong and it, and it gives us good insights um, about that. And the other thing about it is it's quite a significant source in its own right. So we can cut into it and we can look at variations by different types of employers, different sectors, sizes, different parts of the UK. We can take a helicopter view um, and look at the UK as a whole, or we can zoom in um, to areas. So in that context, it's useful. In the context of um, COVID, the challenge is it, it predates the COVID period. So um, the latest service employer skills survey 2019, it's been something that's been going since um, 2011 as a UK tool. Um, so it's great in terms of providing us in time series, but it's kind of a baseline of where we were pre-COVID, which is helpful in terms of understanding all those um, broader issues that are being brought out it, during the COVID period uh, more fully um, within the bulletin. And what's really important about that pre-COVID baseline in uh, 2019, it came, the field work ran until December. We had a few cases then of um, COVID that we were seeing globally. It came at the tail end of a really dramatic and turbulent decade, which had been initiated by the global economic financial crisis. So we're really going through this kind of environment and change and disruption and how businesses are kind of responding to that, which I think really does you know, add value in terms of what it said. And it, it showed us that after a period from 2011, looking at previous surveys where um, there have been growth in economic activity and business confidence, that started to decline by 2019. And the economic tide was turning. That was indicated for a variety of indicators like uh, a fall in recruitment activity and a rise in um, skill deficiencies. The, the survey gives us insights into shortages and gaps and it showed that those were growing and it was showing that they were starting to impact on business performance. So it starts to give us insight into those kind of broader product productivity questions and the extent to which people and talent might be contributing to the productivity problem. Um, and we actually saw, for example, that you know, where skill shortages were growing, they were growing in middle and high skilled uh, roles, and they were already businesses reporting really strong impacts in terms of their performance, like eight in 10 businesses that it said they were impacting on their workloads. And also rather worryingly, again, another indication of the challenge was the fall in training activity and investment in skills. So at a time in a modern economy, when we're here, when we're in to invest in skills we were actually seeing a range of indicators going the other way whether it's the proportion of businesses investing training days the amount of investment um, and actually also the engagement with the publicly funded system if you think of those colleges that are um, engaging with providers only 17 percent engage with colleges eight percent engaging with universities so some real challenges there great insights to use and in a context as we try to repurpose with the government's recovery plan um, post-COVID and start to think where can we target investment to really bring together collaborative solutions that are going to benefit industry and the people that work in them and support all those developments that you know Fiona's been asking for um, to help people moving forward then you know this is a vital source of intelligence not the only 
any sort of intelligence, but it has a, a vital contribution to make. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Leslie. Really, really helpful summary of, of, a, of a big survey. And I particularly wanted just to draw out the really important point you were making there about some of the challenges really predating COVID, something we'll come back to in the discussion. But I think uh, not letting the kind of narrative and particularly the government narrative get away with uh, kind of blaming COVID for everything, because actually a lot of the challenges that we're, we're going to be talking about today are, are things that have had their roots well before um, as well. Now, talking of uh, the importance of business perspective, uh, really delighted to welcome Phil Kenmore, who's head of business development at the Open University, to talk about a really important uh, addition to this uh, kind of area, which is the Open University Business Barometer, and share some of the messages from that. Over to you, Phil. Thanks, Ollie. Um, again, great to be here. Thank you for, for the invitation. The Open University is very keen to, uh, to take part in this debate and uh, contribute to the, this, uh, this bulletin. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about a report we produce called the Business Barometer, um, which we produce every year since 2017. This is our fourth iteration. Um, it is unique and a unique iteration, not surprisingly, given the circumstances of the pandemic and COVID. It has changed the environment somewhat. Um, the way we do this report is a survey about a thousand HR decision makers during July and August of the year. So this report was done during July and August of 2020, so well into the pandemic um, space. And we survey people across the four nations of the UK, we're a four nations university, um, but also SMEs, large organisations, a full range of different sectors as well. Um, the aim of this report, the aim of the business barometer is to help businesses understand the skills landscape and the shortages and issues in their sectors and their regions, um, but also to help um, policymakers and governments across the four nations um, consider the skills shortages and skills issues as well. Um, what's interesting, given the timing of this year's report, is that despite the pandemic, um, over half, 56% of the businesses we spoke to um, said that they were still experiencing quite significant skill shortages. Um, and this, of course, is well into the pandemic period during July and August when we spoke to them. And you, you might argue, despite the wider availability of candidates for some of the, the areas they would want to fill gaps in. Um, during the year 1920, um, businesses told us they spent about £6.6 .6 billion pounds, um, trying to plug short term skills gaps. That compares to £4.4 .4 billion the year before. So this problem is getting worse. It's not getting better. Um, it implies that people perhaps aren't investing enough and thinking about how they fill those gaps. Uh, in terms of how they plan their L&D, their learning and development activity. 61% um, of the businesses were surveyed at that point in time, during July, August 20, were saying they felt they were not agile enough to cope with the current demands being placed on them by the pandemic and the environment around it. And that was due to the skill shortages that they had in their businesses. So those skill shortages that pre-existed the pandemic, because they would have had them already, many of them, were being exacerbated during this period um, when we surveyed them and they could see how it was impacting their ability to respond. No great surprise in that, but it's, of course, something that, you know, in terms of planning for recovery and planning for the future, they need to think about where they go next with that. Um, again, no great surprise, but the skills that were in short supply pre-pandemic are actually the same skills that are causing issues now and, of course, now have a greater value attached to them during this period when people start to think about, hopefully, recovery with the vaccine programme, but also how they cope with the circumstances around them leadership skills, management skills, digital skills, the top three skills coming out from our business barometer again this year. Uh, again, not a new message, but they're still there. They're still a problem. And lots of businesses are not managing to address them in sufficient, um, to a sufficient extent. And therefore the costs that we've talked about around that. Um, the Open University talks a lot with employers about thinking about how to invest in learning and development, particularly to grow your own, invest in your own staff, but also draw in young people and new people into your workforce. Um, and we're hoping that people will build into their recovery strategies as we start, hopefully, to emerge from the pandemic period, how they can address these skill shortages in the way that they need to. About 48% of organisations are already thinking about um, apprenticeships and work-based learning as part of their recovery. And I just want to say a word on apprenticeships, because it's quite a vital part of thinking about how we address skill shortages, particularly in terms of recovery. The information our business barometer on apprenticeships was good and bad news. The bad news bit was that in the current period when we spoke to people, over half of businesses, 56%, were saying they did not expect to be taking on apprenticeships during this period because the commitment was too great given the risk and the environment, the business environment they were in. But luckily, 58% of businesses were also saying that they expected by a 12-month point from when we surveyed them in July, August, by next July, August, to be, to be again engaged with recruiting apprentices and bringing them into their workforce as part of their recovery. Um, we think that's a vital part of the recovery. We think it's vital for young people and, and older workforce as well, um, because you can use apprenticeships for all those people. But also we think it's really good planning for learning and development to be investing heavily, thinking about how they're going to do that when they recover. 
One of the key questions I think which we need to address as we go into the conversation is actually not just how you address the skill shortages, but what challenges will there be around reskilling the workforce? Because there's redundancy, we know there's been furlough going on, but there's a reskilling question whether you've got lots of people who don't have the skills you need, how can you reskill them to address the skills gaps you have around the areas that we've mentioned? And we think that's that's something the report calls out and we think it's worth talking about later. Thanks, Ollie. Bill, thank you so much. And yeah, lovely to have that kind of positive take on the future for apprenticeships as well. Something really, really important for, for the recovery and, and to us here at EDGE. Next, I wanted to welcome Mark Daw, who's Chief Executive of the Skills Network, uh, to tell us a little bit about the research they've been doing about the kind of skills that are growing during COVID. Mark, tell us a little bit about your report. Thanks, Ollie, and uh, great to be with everyone. I, we at the Skills Network, we're, we're an a online uh, training provider we so we you know we can see what's going on across the country the demands for courses uh, both government funded and others and we did some work with MZ around you know oh, since covid what have employers been asking for you know what are the jobs um, that are being asked for and they 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 look at every cv and and one thing they can do is determine the most asked for um, job roles, but the other thing which I think is critically important, probably more important, is the skills that they're looking for from individuals, whatever the job. Um, surprisingly, accountants and auditors uh, uh, are in the top 10. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an accountant by training, so it's nice to see them up there. But obviously, then you've got the care home workers, the van drivers, the cleaners, the storage. Um, but also, interestingly, um, the sort of digital marketing, the business development, uh, and the selling techniques, and these are starting to go into some of the skills. So, it's um, the jobs you can expect, I suppose, if you think you know, what's happening with online um, shopping and stuff like that, and and you know the storage and the warehousing and the care home demand and the health demand. But then when you start looking at the skills, you start to think, well actually those people that are losing their jobs the hospitality industry the retail industry sort of offline bricks and mortar what skills do they have and how do they relate to the health sector how do they relate to business development and selling and immediately you can see that for someone that's worked in retail obviously they're selling and they've got talents there that for for other companies business development, selling their products and, and either online, on the phone or whatever, is a very easy transition to make if you learn about the sector. The hospitality sector is a lot about customer service, about care for your customer. Well, maybe the work in care homes, the work in health actually is an easy transition for them. So I think what, what our report was really saying is obviously there are big shifts. There were big shifts anyway with digital. And, and the need to develop digital skills um, in any role and how those roles are changing. But actually, as the sectors shift up and down, as sort of accelerated by COVID, really, um, think about the skill sets that you've got and how you can move to the sectors that are going to grow and keep booming. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's, it's feeling tough at the moment, but it's not all despair because there are areas where, where there are shortages of employees and opportunities, but it's understanding how you get into those areas. That's great. Thank you so much, Mark. I get to introduce myself next. I just want to share a few messages from a piece of work that we did at Edge, looking at the green economy, another kind of key part of the recovery. Uh, this was done by my colleague Kat, one of our researchers. And I think people have been talking a lot about green jobs as part of the recovery, not least politicians. Um, I don't think there's always been a particularly clear view from them about which jobs count as green jobs. Um, and actually, there's some really exciting work coming down the track from uh, our colleagues at the University of Warwick trying to classify a bit more clearly what we mean by green jobs. I mean, certainly, there are some sectors that would fall directly within that. Um, I think in 2018, there were about 185,000 full-time workers in the kind of low carbon renewable energy economy. Um, that's clearly going to be a sector that we certainly hope will grow um, over coming years. And some of the estimates are, you know, six to 700,000 jobs directly employed in that area by about 2030. So clearly some sectors like that are going to be growing rapidly. But at the same time, I think we should be, and, and we could be expecting to see uh, the kind of greening of existing jobs and sectors as well, uh, not necessarily whole new wind farms, but actually in some of our building sectors, in our construction sector, in healthcare, uh, an element of, of kind of uh, the green economy and the green recovery happening there. 
Um, there have been some big eye-catching announcements from government, of course, as there always are. Uh, Two billion for green home grants, a billion pounds to uh, make energy efficient or more energy efficient public buildings, including schools and hospitals. Definitely steps in the right direction. But I think a big question uh, that others have, have kind of referenced as well about, you know, who's who's leading that, who's kind of pushing particular sectors or particular areas um, over others. Uh, and in this particular area, you know, is it government driving that green agenda? Is it business? Um, is it individuals? Um, Back, but just before Christmas uh, in 2020, um, we ran a big event called Seeding Change uh, and Tim Smith, who founded the Eden Project, was our keynote speaker. We'll put the link to that in the, the show notes from this as well. You may well want to go and have a look at that. Tim has some really exciting, slightly unusual ideas about how we should be making uh, all of our education system much more focused around the environment, as you'd expect. Um, so an interesting take on uh, how we might use the environment and the climate challenge that we face as a way to really kind of reinvigorate education from school all the way through to university. Um, and we're also looking forward to starting a piece of research with colleagues at Oxford University, looking at that green jobs question specifically through the lens of construction. Um, so we'll be kicking that off in March and, and we'll be able to share uh, information about that once it's available too. So the green sector is clearly one area that um, has been growing and, and we would like to see grow more. Uh, another is the digital sector. And one of the pioneers in that area has been uh, ADA, the National College for Digital Skills. So I'm really pleased to welcome Tom Fogden, who's one of the co-founders of Aiden and the Dean to tell us a bit more about their work. Thank you, Ollie. Yeah, no, fantastic to be here. So uh, we set up ADA, the National College for Digital Skills um, seven years ago, and we were the first new further education college to open and it has a, a real specialism um, in digital skills. And for us, our mission is to educate and empower the next generation of diverse digital talent. And for us, that means that we have both a sixth form and we also have post 18 provision as well, high level apprenticeships. The way our sixth form works is we have three pathways, a creative, an entrepreneurial and a, a, a technical pathway. And they all have a common theme around the BTEC in computer science. So everyone that goes there will study that and take complementary A-levels such as maths, further maths, uh, graphics, um, business and psychology. So there's lots of different options and pathways for people. In addition, every term we have off curriculum, mul uh, multiple days working with industry partners. So we work with the likes of Deloitte, Salesforce, King, the makes of Candy Crush, and they work directly with our students through volunteering and create really exciting projects, um, which our students then deliver back and, and present back to them um, with fantastic sort of digital um, assets that they create. It's a, a really exciting opportunity for them these two years in the sixth form, and we support them into whatever next steps are best for the individual. Um, frequently that's university, sometimes they go straight into the world of, of work and technology and apprenticeships, um, we think is a fantastic option just as Phil mentioned, uh, a real uh, game changer for many young people. And that's why we provide uh, high level apprenticeships, level four and six in the digital sector. We do software development, data analytics and tech consultancy as, as our options and pathways. And we work with 40 blue chip companies like Deloitte, Google, um, Facebook, Sainsbury's, a whole broad range of organizations that recognize that uh, that to find young talent, that apprenticeships are a really good option for them. Uh, so that's sort of the, the two halves of that. And it gets really exciting when we start to see now, I've mean, been open for a number of years, um, young people moving through our system and, and getting fantastic outcomes. So um, the case study highlights one, one student called Abby, um, who lives in Rochester in Kent. And her, her, actually her grandparents saw an advert in a newspaper and they thought it might be something that appealed to her. She hadn't done computer science GCSE, but she was interested in tech and was ambitious and wanted to get sort of a job and get moving. And she saw this and she was willing to commute uh, to the sixth form, which is based in Tottenham Hale. So well over an hour every day for the sixth form. And that's not uncommon for our, our sixth form students. They, they recognize uh, the opportunity of working in a sort of cutting edge tech environment with like-minded young people. And we, have fantastic staff as well that really give them the best start and opportunities for them. She did very well there and um, she was selected by Deloitte to join their apprenticeship program and we provide uh, their digital apprenticeship program um, in partnership with them. So 80% of the time she's working as an employee with them as a tech consultant and then 20% she's studying towards her degree with us. And I guess in her own words, I think it really sums up nicely. She says, I'm getting a degree for free, getting paid while I do it 
getting on the job experience and getting the contacts in the area that I'm going to be working in, I feel like I've got a head start. And for me, that's that's really what we're about. Um, we also have a big focus on, on diversity as well. So we have targets of 50% um, women, 50% um, from low and diverse ethnic backgrounds, and we've made really strong progress in all those areas. That's great, Tom. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, you mentioned Tottenham Hale was where you, you started off, and I think you're also operating in Manchester now as well. So you've got a second base too. Um, yeah, that's right. In February, we're starting in Manchester with our high-level apprenticeships, and uh, we also have a base in Whitechapel as well. Tom, thank you so much for that uplifting example. So um, that means we've introduced all of the key parts of our report and I wanted to start to pick up some of the cross-cutting kind of questions and themes that have come out. Now one that came out really quite strongly from Leslie and Fiona's pieces is around this kind of question that I think is on lots of our minds you know is Covid creating completely new challenges for the economy or is it exacerbating as you touched on Fiona some of the things that maybe were underlying maybe sitting there before and as you were saying Leslie some of the kind of maybe the challenges that had, had kind of come when we compare 2011 and 2019 Fiona, what do, you, what do you think on that question? Well, certainly I think uh, what we have seen in all the analysis that we've looked at is that it's those parts of the economy and those demographics of individuals that um, were more disadvantaged, were more behind anyway, that find themselves in a weaker position in order to be able to, to cope with the current crisis. So we know when we look at the profile, for example, of people who have been furloughed or people who have lost their jobs, that they're people with fewer qualifications in lower paid sectors, um, in roles which are seen as being low skilled, even though we know that there's often a really vast amount of skills required to do those jobs well. And so it's a real challenge, I think, to think about how we support them to move around the labour market. We know from our own uh, participation in learning survey that these are the groups of people that are least likely to have taken part in learning and training historically as adults before. And so we need to do quite a lot to think about how we support them to develop their skills or demonstrate their skills and engage with new sorts of employers. So I would definitely say reinforcing inequalities. And we mustn't forget those people who were already very disadvantaged that as we deal with lots of lots more people who are unemployed or lots more people facing redundancy we must we mustn't forget those people who could easily be left off our priority list and um, who were disadvantaged beforehand thanks Fiona that's a really important reflection and, and Leslie what's your what's your thinking on that equally I think that when we're looking at sources like the employer skills survey and starting to track trends over time um, and then looking at some of the COVID intelligence, it does seem to see, it seem to be that it has exaggerated and accelerated um, certain trends. So we have been seeing, um, for example, over time, uh, a fall in uh, investment, employer investment in training and skills, and that's been accelerated um, during the, the COVID crisis. Um, and, you know, as Fiona's um, already identified, that training is very uneven um, in terms of, you know, who it's reaching. And we have seen a growth in the proportions of people that, you know, are not ex um, accessing that, that training. Um, we've certainly seen, you know, in terms of some of the deficiencies that, um, again, they've been um, consistently in, in, in similar areas. When you look at things like shortages over time, they've been in sort of skilled trades, middle roles and high skill roles. And that, you know, that's the, those kind of um, tensions are getting exaggerated. I think what's quite interesting is seeing how COVID though has disrupted certain things, because we've certainly seen a huge growth in some of the service sector and hospitality and, and retail and those kinds of jobs. I think um, parts of the creative industries had really been growing, but with COVID um, pandemic affecting, um, you know, creating social isola um, isolation and affecting those um, sectors that really depend on the footfall and, and, and people, you know, coming in and, um, reacting together you know whether they're watching you know uh, at theaters <laughs> watching shows or in cinemas or you know shopping you know because of that that's really kind of impacted on the growth in those areas and i do think we're going to see fundamental changes there we're not necessarily going to 
grow and go back to um, the, the, the scale of jobs and employment in some of those areas, because I think the other thing that it's accelerated is, is, is technology adoption. And I think people have actually decided that, you know, it's, it's really pushed that forward and people have actually decided that they prefer some of those methods mm. with technology. And so again, that's another area where um, I think we, we'll have to see whether we've, we've disrupted and we're now going forward on, on a new trajectory, a new trend. Thank you so much, Leslie. Yeah, it sounds like accelerate is the kind of key word. Uh, you know, the, this has kind of really uh, kind of pushed apart cracks where they were already showing uh, and also pushed us maybe to accelerate in a positive sense. Some of the things like the, the adoption of technology that maybe might have taken 20 years and we've ended up having to do them in six months, which has been a headache for everyone. But, you know, potentially, I guess, brings benefits. You were starting to kind of um, uh, pull things apart by sector as well in a really helpful way there. And I just wanted to kind of stick with that theme uh, and perhaps come to, to Tom first and say, you know, obviously you're working really closely with the digital sector. How are things feeling in that particular area? Yeah, no, it's an interesting challenge. I suppose first as us as a, an education provider uh, in the digital sector, it's, it's obviously meant that in the first lockdown in March that we all had to move everything online, all of our teaching and learning. Um, fortunately, um, we are a very digitally enabled organisation. All of our students have laptops. All of our staff are very uh, digitally able. So within 48 hours, we did actually manage to make that transition quickly. So that was a big positive. Um, what we see with a lot of our industry partners in our apprenticeship programme is that they work across a broad number of sectors. And it's not always um, clear how each of those are going to fare in, in the coming in the coming months and years and what we see i suppose in the bigger picture is there's a suppression of of apprenticeship numbers in the near future there's there's lots of interesting conversations a bit further down the line but um we've definitely seen that uh, immediately that's a really interesting reflection because i think um people have people have kind of uh put the digital sector in the box of oh well they've done well out of the out of lockdown and of course we have had to use digital skills more um but clearly the, the challenges are still there um now mark's research uh, has also looked at that kind of sectoral uh, presentation so mark for, for you and for the learning providers you work with what what's the kind of sector by sector position for you yeah and hello and obviously i've missed some of the early discussions so i might be repeating things but i think uh, i mean the review we did uh, was sector by sector and obviously there are some sectors that are doing well and some sectors that are doing terribly but I think what the review did was also identify the it's different that we've got to look at jobs and skills very differently because there are a set of skills that actually make you very mobile and and obviously you know the care workers the van drivers those working in warehouses those jobs are shooting up because of that shift we've just been talking about. But actually, you know, we're hearing this, the shift away from retail, the shift away from hospitality. But our research was saying that business development and selling techniques were really important skills in the top 10. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of people that have been working in retail, in, in you know, not online retail, that have some of those skill sets. So one of our jobs really is to look at the skills that are being demanded and work out which of those individuals that are losing their jobs can shift very easily into these new roles. So it's not um, we're losing all these jobs and those people are just stuck. It's how do we transition them? How do we transi transition them into care work? How do we transition them into uh, online retail and, and selling, you know, we, we as an organisation are desperate for good business development managers. And I, I hear that across the board. What, what training, what development is needed to get those individuals into those jobs? I love that point. And it comes back to that theme of transferable skills that we talked about a little bit earlier on. So kind of from that business perspective, and, and Phil, I'd like to bring you in on this one, kind of what do you think are some of the broader lessons that we should be learning for the education sector for how we might be preparing young people for those jobs in the future? Yeah, thanks, Ollie. It's a really good question, isn't it? Because so much is changing so quickly. Um, I think one of the, the key lessons for the education sector is about this transition to, to online and blended learning. Um, I think it's going to be uh, something that's here to stay, not perhaps the extent it's been in the pandemic. It's generated a very rapid change. But I think a lot of students, a lot of employers are going to expect some of that to continue. Um, I think there was a challenge for education providers of all types and all levels. 
where you the difference between taking existing content and putting it online through an online medium versus having content designed to be delivered through a blended and online pedagogy is a quite a large one. Um, and coming from the Open University, I you know we know that because that's that's our business. Um, and I think there's something for all education providers to think about how they start designing from scratch or redesigning their their courses and their education to be ready for. Um, an online pedagogy, a blended pedagogy that really works in a sustainable way for students because there's, there's something about helping students be really successful through that medium. Um, I think there's something about education providers being responsive and adaptable to employers in particular. Yes, we should all already be in that space, some of us more than others, you know, it, it's variable across the market, but I think it really focuses the mind. Um, you know, as employers really struggle to come out of the pandemic and recover, they will need all the assistance we can give them, and so will all the people coming into employment, young people leaving school, but also people reskilling and having to shift employment through redundancy or, or perhaps through further reskilling within businesses. Um, I suppose the final thing I'd say is I think there's something about being more broad minded about things like apprenticeships, you know, I mean, Tom's talked about apprenticeships, the Open University is a, one of the largest apprenticeship providers in England. Um, we think there's something about education providers really helping young people focus on apprenticeships and others within the workforce and see that as a really strong opportunity to reskill and, and develop their careers. Great answer, Phil. And I think that that blended uh, learning kind of is going to be, again, the buzzword of 2021 and obviously Open University at the forefront of that. I think from our perspective in Edge, the other kind of element uh, harking back to that point about transferable skills is perhaps thinking about whether the current education system, particularly in school and college, does enough to help to develop those broader skills uh, and whether actually we might need to rethink some of the assessment uh, methodology uh, and maybe try and broaden out from just those written exams to thinking about actually how can we drive the system on a broader broader set of measures that creates young people who are more, more, more rounded and have some of those skills that employers through all of these surveys are, are telling us that they need. Now, I just wanted to kind of close it thinking about those young people by asking each of you uh, for a bit of advice. So for, for young people who are kind of navigating this difficult uh, labour market, these difficult changes, um, obviously uh, it's not going to be easy, um, but what would be your kind of nugget of wisdom as they start to do that? Um, Fiona, what would you say to young people? Great, thank you. Uh, well, of course, um, this generation of young people face some real challenges, don't they, both around what um, has happened to their education um, and to employment. Uh, it's great to see that so many more have stayed um, in education and not um, on those unemployment figures. And I think what we need to do is to make sure that there's really good opportunities for them to connect to those new jobs of the future, jobs that, that are in growth areas. Um, and to um, kind of engage in the provision that sorts those connections. It's great to see so many projects, say from Prince's Trust and other organisations like that, looking to connect young people to employers and make the best use of technology and uh, would really encourage young people to engage with those sorts of programmes so that they can find out about all the jobs of the future that may not be here yet, but certainly they could be stepping into um, as this crisis finishes. Great advice, Fiona. Thank you. Leslie? What I'd really emphasise is, you know, encouraging young people to push forward on those things that were in, within their control. And, you know, that part of that is about, you know, vitally education and getting the platform of skills uh, and knowledge uh, in place. But if you look again at, at sources like the Employee Skills Survey, what they employers in large numbers emphasise, regardless of the size of employer or the sector, is having a lot of broad ranging life experience. <laughs> I don't just mean work experience, we get hung up on that work experience piece, but it does mean, you know, going out there and having hobbies and extracurricular activities and volunteering and, and doing those sorts of things that really open up your world, reading, you know, reading current affairs and knowing what's going on in the world and all of those things are really important things that young people can do. And I think connecting that with, you know, notice with interest, a lot of surveys in a context the modern world increasing proportions of young people saying they want to be their own boss and this in this kind of agile world and with flexible working and so on why not <laughs> you know we're constantly talking about innovation and so on so i'd really like to inspire young people to grasp that thorny nettle and do all these sorts of things to really embellish their cvs and their their portfolios i love it thank you so much leslie uh, mark what would your advice be um well i became an accountant in the late 80s when the recession hit and for the first time ever they were making accountants redundant 
and it seemed like the end of the world. And so, I mean, my first bit of advice is we always have cycles and, and you may be looking at this thinking, oh my God, that's the end. It does get better. So that, that would be my first, bit. I've got teenage kids, so, you know, I'm having to say some of this. Um, the second thing is clearly people will have a passion about something and a, and, and a desire to do something. We'll take that passion, that desire and work out where are the jobs? Where do you think the jobs are? Where are the sectors that actually you can apply that, enjoy your work, and there'll be opportunity? And the third thing I'd say is, is reflecting the what people call soft skills. And you know, I did a piece with the vice chancellor of the Open University of what the FE paper, FE white paper should be about. And one of them is let's rename soft skills hard skills, because they are the hard skills. You need to be able to look at someone in the eye when you're talking to them uh, and things like that. And, and, you know, do focus on those things that, that you know, employers are looking for. Um, my plea is, plea, as soon as we try and assess these things, we kill them. Um, and so we've got to be very, very careful as an education industry, not to say, right, here's the list of 10 things and here's the assessment you're going to do. And if you tick those boxes, then you will have those skills. It doesn't work like that. So that's one of the things we need to be careful about uh, going forward as an education industry. That's great. Thank you. Live advice from Mark. Uh, thank you. That's great. And a nice link across to, to Phil. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that link, Mark. Um, uh, my main piece of advice to young people would be really simple. It would just be to keep learning. No matter what the circumstances, no matter the circumstances you find yourself in, whether you're in work, out of work, furloughed, in, in, still in education, just keep looking for opportunities to learn more and more, particularly around the areas that you want to go into. Um, there is so much free learning out there. Um, it varies in quality, um, but there's some really high quality stuff out there from lots of different education providers. The Open University, for example, has a platform called OpenLearn, um, over 10,000 free courses on there. Um, usage of that during the beginning of the pandemic went from 20,000 visits a day to 80,000, then to 200,000. Um, and a lot of that was driven by young people. So I say to young people, keep learning, look for opportunities, find free courses, find free content, you know, do whatever you can to keep learning. Um, I suppose the other thing I'd just say is don't dismiss the opportunities of apprenticeships, even if you're in work, you may get offered the opportunity. It's a fantastic chance to continue to grow and learn and develop um, if you get offered the opportunity. Fantastic advice. Thank you, Phil. And last but not least, Tom. Yeah, definitely reiterate what a number of people have said. And I do think apprenticeships should be considered as a number of things that they will apply for. Um, not necessarily the only thing, but sort of have many strings to your bow, look out there, there's some fantastic opportunities, the government website's a good place to start, they're all there, and, and start thinking and looking. And um, there may not be the huge number that there was perhaps a year ago, but that'll start opening up, and you can use your time wisely in your bedroom. Um, there are loads of great free resources. Um, you can't go wrong with digital, it's huge, so follow your interest, follow your curiosity, and see where it leads you. Thank you so much, Tom. So it just remains for me to say a huge thank you to all my guests today. You can find out more about all of the reports we've been talking about in the Skills Shortage Bulletin that's now published on the EDGE website. We'll put the link in the show notes. And you can also join the debate on Twitter at UK EDGE or at UK EDGE Policy. Thanks very much. <laughs>